Okay, uh, I've dropped the link to the seminar webpage in the chat. Uh, go ahead and hop on there to check out the future presentations that we have going on, to uh, see previous recordings of talks, um, as well as to sign up for the listserv if you're not already on that. Um, so uh, for today, we'll have a, I'll introduce the speaker. Um, we'll have a uh, time where he'll be presenting and then we'll have some discussion afterward. And then at the very end, uh, we'll go with some community no news, uh, job postings, uh, upcoming workshops and seminars just to keep the community engaged uh, with one another. Um, so I'll go ahead and introduce Dr. Henrik Mellon. Uh, Dr. Henrik Mellon obtained his PhD from the University of College London in 2006, studying emissions from the upper atmospheres of the giant planets using ground-based near-infrared observations. He spent his first postdoc in Los Angeles working on the ultraviolet instrument team on the Cassini mission, undertaking mission planning and the study, uh, studying the neutral oxygen torus produced by the moon Enceladus. In 2009, he moved to the University of Leicester, where he became a Cassini participating scientist, working on multispectral auroral observations at Saturn. After branching out to radiative transfer modeling of the troposphere and stratosphere of Jupiter for a brief while, he is now at STFC James Webb Fellow, working on analyzing JWST data from the giant planets. And today he'll be talking to us about the ever-changing ionosphere of Uranus. Take it away. Great. Can you hear me? Hopefully. We can hear you. Great, thanks. Thanks for that introduction, Mallory. I appreciate it. And it's great to be here this afternoon or this morning uh, amongst fellow ice giant fans. So I'll be talking mostly about Uranus, a little bit about Neptune as well. On the left, you can see a movie. This is a movie taken by the Eye shell guide camera called Kyle. So we're, we're observing, doing spectroscopy of, of, of Uranus, but the guide camera takes some beautiful pictures. So we can see it's like a mini tour of the Uranus system. We can see three moons rotating around the planet. We can see this object that moves in a straight line. It's obviously it's a fixed galaxy in the background. So as Uranus zooms across the screen, it appears to be moving. You can see the rings, the bright polar cap, uh, and the atmosphere of Uranus right there. So Uranus and Neptune are of course in the outer reaches of our solar system. I think Neptune receives something like 0.5% of the sunlight we receive here on Earth. Uh, like Jupiter and Saturn are dominated by hydrogen and helium and they're about the four times the size of our Earth. So Uranus and Neptune are both different in the sense, well compared to uh, Jupiter and Saturn, in that they have highly offset magnetic field, fields. And these magnetic fields also have some really complicated octopole and quadrupole components in them, making the field actually rather different from uh, certainly Saturn. Uh, by extension, these are the most common size planets seen outside uh, our solar system, sort of Neptune-sized exoplanets. And I thought I'd start by doing a little bit of history, only because it sort of tickles me. Uh, for you know, millennia, we only knew of the planets to, between Mercury uh, and Saturn. And not, it's not until William Herschel, probably with a lot of help from his sister Caroline, discovered Uranus in 1781 in his back garden in Bath in Southwest England. Uh, and it's a great place to visit. If you ever find yourself there, you can see sort of feel the wings of history in this back garden. The first the discovery of a new planet since, you know, forever. Uh, and that was Uranus, of course, in 1781. He thought initially that this was a comet and he published this uh, in, in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society. But later it proved to be an actual brand new planet. And this made William a bit of a superstar in, in the UK. And he got loads of grants from the king and he built this giant 40-foot 40, 40 telescope out in Slough, uh, where he made other discoveries. Uh, Slough is now, however, very close to Heathrow Airport and not really the place you want to be doing uh, astronomy. So 
plus Uranus, right? And then once Uranus was discovered, people started making astronomical al almanacs of the Alexis Bouvard at the top. And he made predictions of where you were going to find Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus in the night sky. And this prediction worked well for, for Jupiter and Saturn, but it did not work at all for Uranus. And so people started theorizing there should be this additional planet out there, the new planet. And through some clever maths uh, by Adams and Leverrier, uh, they made predictions of where to look at a particular time. And Neptune was first observed by Godfrey, Godfrey Gall uh, in 1846 in, in Berlin. And it's a nice quote saying, the planet whose place you have computed really exists. So this is obviously unlike Uranus, it's not a chance discovery. This is people sitting down with pen and paper, making predictions of where to find this new planet, really a new era in science. So that's the history done. Uh, I'm gonna talk in this presentation about the up upper atmosphere of Uranus and a bit of Neptune. And I thought I'd start by defining what I mean by that. So that is the region that sits above the homopause. So above the homopause, merc molecular diffusion dominates over turbulent mixing, this edit, edit diffusion effectively. And as because of that, each species is separated out in altitude according to their molecular weight. Right? That means that all the heavy stuff, like the hydrocarbons, uh, sit at the bottom, just above the homopause, very close to the homopause, and the upper atmosphere as a whole is dominate, dominated by hydrogen and molecular hydrogen. That means also it's low density. There's two basic components to the upper atmosphere, and that's the uh, ionosphere, which is which is the charged particle component, and is the thermosphere, which is the neutral component. Uh, the ionosphere is produced by two ways. I'll talk about this, but more, more later, but it's hydrogen, uh, sorry, <laughs> solar EUV photonization or impact, particle impact ionization. Those are the two ways to create an ionosphere, right? And one of the most important ions in the ionosphere is H3+, which we can observe using telescopes on the ground in the near infrared, uh, as well as in space, like the James Webb Space Telescope. So why do we even care about this region? Well, uh, this is this is a schematic of the Earth, right? And it, it shows you that this is the region through which you get these vast currents in the magnetosphere that run through the ionosphere. And the ionosphere acts, acts, acts as a bit, a bit like a resistor. So the currents flow through this resistive medium and it sort of heats it in the process. So this is actually a way to inject energy into the atmosphere. On the right, you see a schematic of all the processes that occur in the ionosphere. And there's lots going on, right? And we expect all these processes to be present at uh, the giant planets, but perhaps with added ferocity. There are faster rotators that have stronger magnetic fields uh, and that have weird offsets to their magnetic fields as well. So most about what we know about Uranus and Neptune comes from, from this guy, and this is Voyager 2. Of course, and I always like to point out that uh, Comic Sans, which is the font used here, was released in 1992. So Comic Sans is younger than the information we have about Uranus and Neptune. So you know, we have it's high time we started thinking seriously about sending something new there, right? Uh, so let me show you some a little summary of what Voyager 2 saw in relation to the upper atmosphere. So we'll start with these atmospheric profiles. There was just a stellar and solar occultations by the UVS ultraviolet spectrograph instrument. And I've tried to put them on the same vertical scales here, right? So you can see the kilometers. Well, it's uh, on the left, we have Uranus, right? And we can see yeah, it's a little hard to read, but you see it's dominated by molecular hydrogen and it's really extended. You look at Neptune, same thing, dominated by molecular hydrogen and it's very compressed. So just from an atmospheric structure point of view, the both planets, these two planets are actually quite different, right? So Uranus is really extended, Neptune is really compressed, and this is probably connected to the fact that Uranus has very little internal heat, whereas Neptune has lots of internal heat, and this can drive this convective motion in the atmosphere, basically pushing the homopause up in altitude at Neptune. 
Another thing you can see from these plots is that the, both planets were observed to have temperatures in the exabase, basically the edge of the atmosphere at the top, of about 750 Kelvin. So both Uranus and Neptune were 750 Kelvins, which is, of course, really hot. And it is, in fact, too hot. So this is one of the big questions we have in planetary science. Why are the upper, upper atmospheres of the giant planets so very hot? And this is exemplified in this table. Uh, so there's a TXO, it's the temperatures we observe, roughly. So Jupiter is observed to be 940 Kelvin, Neptune 600 Kelvin-ish. Uh, but when we sit down and calculate what the temperatures ought to be based on solar input alone, we come up with numbers that are hundreds and hundreds of Kelvin cooler than what we actually observe. So the bottom row in this tab table shows you the difference between the calculated and the observed temperatures. And you can see there's, there's a huge amounts of energy that the solar input alone cannot account for. That's the energy crisis. And we'll come back to this in more detail. Actually, I think it's now. So there's two principal solutions to the energy crisis. Uh, firstly, the auroral process whereby you can, whereby, well, you inject current into the atmosphere, you're driving through the ionosphere and you heat it by way of dual heating. And this can, in the case of Jupiter, inject terawatts of energy. And there's lots of energy at the poles. And we can do a fairly good job at explaining why the poles are hot, because we have a good heat source there. But the energy, energy crisis affects these planets globally. And so we need a way to move auroral energy down towards the equator. And that's actually really difficult. Uh, these planets, in particular Jupiter, are really fast rotators, and that creates immense Coriolis forces. So it's actually very difficult to move energy from the pole all the way down to the equator. There has been some suggestions by, by varying the auroral input, perhaps with some kind of variable solar wind shock fronts. Uh, you can create waves of heat propagating down towards the equator. Uh, this paper by Yates et al. showed that. But if you look at the color bar there, uh, you can transport you know, 25 Kelvin or so down to the lowest equator, whereas we need several hundreds. So it's not quite, not quite as simple as that. The second solution or potential solution to the energy crisis is wave heating. And here, you look at Jupiter, everywhere you look in Jupiter, there's a storm. This, this turbulent lower atmosphere can generate gravity waves, basically with shears between two different uh, liquids, you know, where the shears generate gravity waves, they can propagate up in altitude, they break and they release their energy and heat the upper atmosphere in the process. And this a little, the modeling is ambiguous on this. Some models say that this could actually heat the atmosphere, other models say it could cool the atmosphere. There's one observation of this, and that's at the bottom, the bottom left there, where James Donahue observed a really hot temperature above the great red spot. Uh, and this is, really the only example we have of this so it, it would appear that this process could be time variable or is happening at maybe low levels uh, all the time you know, there's, there's storms everywhere you can have low level heating everywhere so but this is something that is really poorly uh, so far so talk about the auroral emissions so voyager 2 observed Aurora at Uranus. So this is atomic, I'm sorry, molecular hydrogen in the ultraviolet. And I've mapped those emissions onto a sphere as Uranus would look like during the 2007 equinox. And so all those black dots are auroral emissions. They rotate in and out of view. I think, interesting side note, I think in the concept of the energy crisis, where the atmosphere, upper atmosphere is hot, uh, it might actually help having this offset between rotational and magnetic field axis in that you can actually heat the equator a lot more easy if the aurora occurs close to it. Uh, but anyway, this is what the aurora looks like rotating in and out of view. For Neptune, the Voyager 2 observations were a lot more uh, ambiguous. There was so the observational geometry is shown on the, on the top right, observing the central meridian on the night side, and you can see the brightness versus longitude of that sort of box across the disk. And there is no real clear peak in emission. Uh, I think the aurora is supposed to be somewhere around 
270 if you look at the magnetic field models, but it is, it is, is it a detection? I don't know. It's, it's very ambiguous. And uh, we also looked at the aurora of Uranus with the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, and this is by Laurent Lamy. And the signal to noise here is a real challenge. So the raw data is at the top, and there are some helpful arrows indicating where to look for the auroral emissions. Uh, this is two different dates, uh, 2011 and 1998, with a geometry in the middle there. You can do some smoothing and a background disk subtraction, and it appears a little bit better in the bottom row, uh, but it is really challenging. So this is really discrete spots of aurora, maybe some kind of cusp reconnection happening, producing very, very discrete features. They also seem to be variable highly variable. Sometimes you don't see anything. Sometimes you see, uh, at best, something like this. Okay, so this is the very simple chemistry that occurs in the upper atmosphere. So the upper atmosphere is mostly atomic and molecular hydrogen. Uh, you can throw energy into that system, whether it be charged particles in the auroral process or solar EUV photons. And when you do that, you can do one of two things. You can either excite the constituents of the atmosphere, and that produces emissions in the ultraviolet, which you can see with the HST, for example, uh, or you can ionize uh, atomic and molecular hydrogen, and that produces H2+. Now, H2+, is almost instantly converted to H3+. It's an exothermic reaction, so there's basically no H2+, around at all, it all, it all gets converted to H3+, and H3+, emits in the near infrared, which can be observed from telescopes on his IRTF and Mauna Kea, for example, uh, or the James Webb Space Telescope. H2, new, uh, neutral H2, also emits in the near infrared, but it's, compared to H3+, and it's an extremely inefficient emitter. So... H plus is the best tool we have to look at the upper, upper atmosphere and the ionosphere. So at the top, we have the, reac the reaction where H2 plus uh, reacts with molecular hydrogen to produce H3 plus. The intensity of the H3 plus emission is given by this sort of general expression. And it doesn't really matter what all this stuff is. I just want to point out that the intensity we observe is linearly proportional to the number density, the number of HO plus ions, and is exponentially dependent on the temperature. And so as something cools down, it becomes a lot, lot harder to observe. At the bottom, well, okay. So we can also so we can produce HO plus by injecting energy, but you can also lose HO plus recombination with electrons. We, uh, this obviously, we, <laughs> Uh, dissociation uh, as well, and HO plus cannot coexist with anything heavier than molecular hydrogen, effectively. So it can't coexist with methane, which sits right at the base of the, of the homopause, right? And so where you have methane, you don't have HO plus. They're sort of mutually exclusive. So methane eats up HO plus. So that's why above the me uh, methane layer, HO plus will dominate below it. We could probably have some hydrocarbon ions uh, deeper down, effectively. So if you want to have a go at modeling H3+, we have developed this H3+, um, uh, modeling package in Python called Happy, which you can install and, you know, have a play around with if you want. Just a little sales pitch. Uh, it's fun. So here's sort of what H3 plus looks like from the giant planets. Uh, H3 plus was first discovered at Jupiter, Saturn, at Uranus, sort of in the late 80s and early 90s. Uh, we have yet to discover H3 plus at Neptune, which is a real weird thing, and we'll come back to that. So Uranus, of course, is, is, is the target of this particular talk, and it was first discovered in 1993, or 1992 was the data. So Larry Trafton did this using the United Kingdom Infrared Telescope, which is now sadly uh, no longer, uh, it operates, but not under the, the British flag, I guess, in Hawaii. 
So Larry discovered a temperature of 740 Kelvin. Remember Voyager 2 saw Uranus at around 750 Kelvin with some sizable error bars. Uh, and so since this discovery, people have observed Uranus sporadically. It's not been a real uh, targeted approach to this, just you know, whenever people got around to doing it, people observe Uranus. So when I first got to Leicester, I sat down and I reanalyzed all the ex existing observations we had of Uranus, taking us up to 2006. And this is what this looks like. So this is a paper I published in 2011. So on the left, you see the average temperature. If there's more observations, uh, if, if there's more than one observation in one year, I'll do yearly average. But it basically shows you that the temperature appears to be cooling as a function of time. So if temperature on the y-axis, time on the x-axis, and as we move towards, uh, well, 2007, that's why the, so the dash curve is sort of the solar illumination angle, uh, latitude rather. And so where it dips in 2007, that's the, that's the equinox. And I published this paper saying, okay, this makes total sense. You know, at, after equinox, the temperature should Definitely, should definitely start ramping back up again. So some kind of well-behaved, well-structured seasonal behavior. And I, 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 I started this observational program uh, using a number of telescopes to observe Uranus for a number of years to see what happened basically after equinox. Was this a, a decent prediction <laughs> or, or was it not? Uh, so we have a number of observations uh, from a number of instruments and telescopes. So we used iShell on the RTF, uh, NearSpec on Keck, Genus on Gemini North, uh, Specs on the uh, IRTF, and Cryres on the VLT. So between 2011 and 2018, we had a 47 nights of observation to build a really good baseline uh, from which to extract the long-term behavior of Uranus's upper atmosphere. Uh, I'm going to show you all of these observations. So this is the spectra we get, by the way. So we have intensity as a function of wavelength or spectral pixels. We can use this happy fitting program to fit a model to the data. From that model, we do get both the number density, i.e. the number of the column, number in the column of, of emitting H plus ions, and as well the temperature of the upper atmosphere. So very useful. So here's what that plot looks like. So we have here temperature as a function of time uh, between 2011 and 2020. Uh, there is a lot going on there. There's an interesting amount of scattering these observations. Generally, I mean, how can you change the temperature of the upper atmosphere so quickly? That's one question. It's, you know, in the context of the energy crisis, these temperatures are way, way too hot anyway. A variable auroral input could do this. Could gravity waves do this? I don't know. There is a weird outlier in 2014 and 2015. I don't know if you can see my, I can't see, can't see. But in 2014 and 2015, there are some really hot temperatures, well, as hot in 2011, but this is when a storm broke out at Uranus. Is that connected? Could these storm outbreaks lead to heating the upper atmosphere that you know that's an open question uh, but if i plot this all these temperature measurements again if there's, if there's more than one measurements per year i will average average the measurements for yearly uh yearly average <laughs> effectively and so if i can plot this like this so this is all the observations from 1992 back to, to, to 2019 and there is a clear trend here right I predicted naively that the upper atmosphere would start to heat up again after equinox in 2007. Uh, it clearly hasn't. It has continued to cool. Uh, and so it's cooled now for, well, in this plot, 27 years. And the length of a season uh, is what, 21 years, right? So 84, 84 years divided by four. So this, if this is seasonal behavior, it's very strange, right? It didn't heat up after equinox. It's continued to cool. And as we approach the next solstice, what is it, 2028, 
where it appears that at one solstice in 1986, the upper atmosphere was hot. At the next solstice, the upper, upper atmosphere is going to be cold. How do you explain that? It's a good question. I, I'll, I'll try and <laughs> explain it with some high quality clip art. So as Uranus, Uranus, you know, some one thing that defines Uranus is it's a really strange uh, geometry, right? It rotates on its sides. The seasons are extreme. And so if it's just driven by geometry, you expect the solstices to be identical. And clearly they're not, just shown on, on the left here. So we have a scenario on the right where one solstice is the opposite of the other solstice, right? So we're seeing the bottom, as we approach the other solstice, we hit the bottom of that curve. Uh, and so that's that's where, where this prediction is heading. And how do you do that? How do you produce two different solstices? I guess the obvious one is a rural input. The magnetic field is not symmetric with, well, let me rephrase that. The center of the magnetic field doesn't sit in the center of the planet. It's offset by a third Uranian radar from the center of the planet. That means if you're looking at Uranus, at the two different solstices from the sun, the magnetic configuration will look different. And so different magnetic configurations could lead to different amounts of auroral heating in the upper atmosphere. I think that's a basic principle. Uh, but how, how, how big an effect can that be? That's an open question. Uh, so I've, I've shown you the yearly averages. Uh, temperature is a function of time. Uh, we've also been looking a lot at trying to detect uh, morphology of Uranus' aurora, uh, but it's been really, really challenging. I guess another consequence, which I didn't mention, let me go back. Uh, as Uranus cools, you know, we were at the end here, we're like on 500 Kelvin. Uh, since the intensity is dependent on the temperature, is exponentially dependent on the temperature. As Uranus cools, it's becoming harder to observe. And so in 2018, the brightness of the HA plus ionosphere was only 5% of what it was in 1998. So this kind of a strange battle as you know, we build better telescopes, we build better instruments, Uranus is actually becoming harder to observe. So that's something we have to factor in when we plan these observations. Uh, Right, so we're trying to map out the morphology of the aurora. And so Emma Thomas did a study, which is published in Nature Astronomy last year. And so we had this data set taken with Keck in 2006, so just before equinox. And there appears to be some kind of variability as Uranus rotated underneath the slit. And that variability possibly could indicate that we're actually seeing the morphology of the aurora, maybe for the first time in the near infrared. And these are the maps that she produced. So we have intensity. So, so these, all, all of these maps show latitude and this arbitrary longitude, since we've lost the longitude of Uranus uh, for, you know, since the Voyager 2 era. And the intensity map shows you there are bright spots and there's dark spots. And if these brightness features are auroral in nature, then they must be produced by an increase in the column density. So a localized increase in column density means a localized enhancement in the production, which means a rural precipitation. You can't produce localized enhancement in density with solar EUV. You know, EUV is uniform across the disk. It has to be something very localized, and Aurora is the best candidate for that. And so we look at the temperature on the bottom left. The temperature is actually pretty flat. Uh, and you finally look at the density on the bottom right, you do see that these intensity features are largely driven by the density. So this is consistent with the presence of localized enhancement in the ionization rate effectively. So you have discrete features driven by density, that's aurora. Uh, what's interesting about this, though, we can try and figure out how this relates to previous Voyager 2 observations. Uh, so 
if we just look at the bottom figure here, and that's the Voyager 2 observations of the northern auroral emissions uh, using the ULS system, which is the Voyager 2 one. And we see enhanced H2 plus emissions really quite far away, basically at lower L shells than what Voyager 2 saw. The L shells are shown at the bottom, top, uh, top right there. And so what does that mean? Well, it means, A, we know that the aurora is highly variable at Uranus. Even the, the, the map that Floyd Herbert did on the Voyager 2 emissions, they're very patchy and do see bright features outside the main auroral region, right? Could this be something similar? Or are we seeing emissions related to an internal source of plasma, for example? Like, is there a moon that could emit material that becomes ionized and forms a plasma source within the magnetosphere? Uh, it's an interesting question, and we need more of these observations. And luckily, uh, help is a hand uh, because we have the James Webb Space Telescope. And this is, I mean, obviously, it's an extraordinary facility. It has these I integral field units, which gives you, this is the near spec IFU in the near infrared. It gives you a three by three arc second field of view, which is look almost perfect for Uranus. You can fit almost the whole planet in there. Uh, it's more challenging to observe Jupiter and Saturn with these IFUs because they're just so large in the sky. But for Uranus and Neptune, they're absolutely perfect. Uh, and so some uh, time was awarded to Heidi Hamill, who coordinated the plant uh, solar system observations in the guaranteed time program to be executed during the first cycle, so basically from the summer of 2022. Uh, and I'll show you the first spectrum we have of Uranus from the James Webb Space Telescope. And that's shown here at the top. This is data from uh, January last year. And so, I mean, it's, it's, this data is astonishing, right? So the top of radiance is a function of wavelength. Uh, and the red line is the model, there's a black line exactly underneath it, which shows you the data. Uh, and we can fit a temperature here to, with an error of 0.9 Kelvin. This is just amazing, isn't it? Uh, never, never be able to do anything like this from the ground, right? And you can put this temperature measurement in the context of the long-term study I showed you earlier, and that's shown at the bottom here. So you have temperature as a function of time, and this recent James Webb observations obviously the error bars won't even show up on this plot, uh, is consistent with continued cooling. So this is 2023, we're seeing continued cooling basically from when uh, H3 plus was discovered in 1992, and we're seeing cooling all the way out to last year. So there's no sign at all that this cooling is in any way ramping back up towards the next uh, solstice, right? So the cooling continues. And I, I, I'll change my prediction from uh, earlier on. I, I, I do think it seems likely that the two solstices, solstices will be very, very different. Uh, it's kind of fun. It's a fun challenge. We can also map H plus uh, out spatially. So here, here I'm showing you the observations we have. We have three longitudes separated by 120 degrees rotation. Uh, and this is plotted in RA deck space. So the top row basically shows you where the clouds are in the lower atmosphere, so in the troposphere and the stratosphere, uh, to give you a sense of orientation. And the bottom row, I, I only plot the H plus component in the spectrum. And so the yellow circles are the same latitude and longitude, and the blue circles are the same latitude and longitude. And so in, these, in this snapshot of Uranus, we do see both the northern and the southern auroral emissions at the same time uh, with some very good signal to noise as well. But they look very similar to the Hubble observations. So very spot-like, very confined in latitude and longitude. So this is something I'm working on right now, this little preview. It's, it's super exciting to have these sort of spatially resolved views of Uranus, really hard to do from the ground. And JWST is the facility to do this with. Uh, looking a little bit into the future, 
we do have an accepted program for cycle three. It was a rough cycle for, for if you were interested in planets. Only two proposals were accepted to look at planets as this one uh, and one to look at Saturn's uh, ionosphere, a rural ionosphere. Uh, and this is going to be really fun. We're going to be looking at Uranus over a full rotation. So we're going to stare at the planet for 17 hours watching it rotate and so we can see how these rural emissions evolve as they move through local times and that you know we'll be able to make strides towards understanding what generates the aurora are there internal plasma sources we're also going to characterize the vertical structure of the upper atmosphere and this is going to be mission critical uh, for any orbit insertion uh, at the planet so you know if we're going to put a spacecraft in orbit around Uranus, you have to know what you're flying through, right? You have to know what the upper atmosphere is doing. And part of that is understanding this long-term trend in the up uh, temperature uh, of the upper, upper atmosphere as well. Uh, okay, I have maybe two slides uh, of Neptune. Uh, so that's a lot about Uranus, right? So what about Neptune? Well, models suggest and these are, this is two examples being plotted here, that if the models are right, HG plus should be easily detectable with existing facilities on the ground. Yet, when we try to see HG plus at Uranus, it just happened. So here's a couple of examples of us trying. So at the top, we have a spectral image effectively of Uranus at the bottom, and Neptune at the top, and this is your spectral lines. So Uranus, bright, beautiful, great stuff. Uh, whereas Neptune, we don't see anything. There's not even a hint of any H plus emission in Neptune. And I went to IRTF and stared at Neptune for, for four nights. Uh, I didn't see anything. And so, what does this mean? Why are we not seeing H plus and Neptune? Well, are the models wrong? Do they overestimate the density or is Neptune a bit like Uranus? Has the temperature of the upper atmosphere changed since Voyager 2? If you take a Uranus, you know, that's, that's certainly true for Uranus. So, uh, Luke Moore explores this in, in a great paper from 2020. So we have a lot of questions arising from this, right? The energy crisis, where does this heat come from? And in particular for Uranus and Neptune, who doesn't, well, certainly Uranus doesn't seem to have a very sort of fierce or bright auroral emissions, which seems to suggest maybe there's limited amount of energy being injected in, a, in the form of currents. What about wave heating? Is that important? Uh, the upper atmospheres of Uranus and Neptune are different. You know, the upper atmosphere is of Uranus are really extended, uh, whereas Neptune is really likely very compact. Uh, what is the magnetosphere, ionosphere, thermosphere interaction of these planets? Uh, we don't know, right? It's, not, it's, it's a very complicated magnetic field, very compli complicated rotational geometry. And how do you disentangle all that uh, cohesively? I think the new James Webb observations will help with this, and it'll be interesting to see when we get that. Uh, and of course, what drives these, this long-term change in the temperature of the upper atmosphere at Uranus? And of course, we want to detect H plus and Neptune. So uh, I'm just going to leave my conclusions up there. And thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much. Um, put your claps in the put your clap reaction up. Um, yeah, thank you so much. This was really interesting. I really loved your uh, your brief history lesson at the beginning. Um, so if you have questions, um, this is our discussion period now, feel free to put your questions in the chat um, or raise your hand and we'll go through them. Um, I see we already have some questions. Uh, go ahead, Mark. Oops. Okay. Uh, hey, Henry. Great, great talk. Um, I have two related questions. One is you you talked about the the exponential 
dependent on temperature, linear on, on density. In your retrievals, how confident are you in being able to separate temperature and density effect? I, I, I did a modeling study on this very topic in, in like 2014, I think. So I think we have a robust understanding. Uh, basically, our error bars we get out of the retrieval process reflect the real uncertainty. Basically, so yes, we can pull out temperature and density, and the errors will reflect the uncertainty. Basically, okay, and then. Um, this, I think it's a related question is just um, when you talk about the temperature of the thermosphere, are you really talking about the temperature of the brightest spots? Or do those dominate the emission or is it really in some sense an average temperature of the upper atmosphere? Well, yeah, the way I'm doing it from the ground is to you, you stick a spectrograph slit on the planet and just let this planet spin underneath the slit. And then you gather all the data and produce an average spectrum. Okay. Obviously, if there's something really bright, a really bright feature in that spectrum that would dominate the signal, uh, would it? I don't know. But anyway, we don't really see bright things at Uranus. You know, the mm -hmm. contrast between the rural emissions and so the background solar EUV produced ionosphere is very small. So, oh, okay, well, actually, I guess that oh, that makes sense, and that answers the question really. So that it's that it's those bright regions that those are the temperatures you're measuring because that's the only emission you're seeing, really, yeah. from those bright regions. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Um, I have a question. So you mentioned at one point that it's possible that a storm could cause an increase in temperature in the upper atmosphere, but it's not, we're not certain. Um, could it be that this long-term cooling that you're observing is the result or the residual of a catastrophic storm early on um, and that it's, it's, con it's continuing to cool after the storm has dissipated? That's an interesting idea. I like it. I, I guess if you think it's just if you think about like thermal 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 inertia. The thermal inertia of the upper atmosphere is, you know, things can change really quickly. You know, it's because it's so tenuous. There's not a lot of stuff there. So I mean, if there's something changing in the lower atmosphere. because of an event, an impact, something like that. I guess if that changes the rate at which gravity waves deposit heat, yeah, I guess that's possible. Yeah, interesting. Do we, do we know of any catastrophic impacts at Uranus? Is it like, can we even see it from here? I don't know. Um, I, I don't know, I mean, um, so I'm, I'm a geologist. I, I like to look at the, the icy satellites, um, but the whole, the whole system is, is on its side, right? Um, could that, could there be residual from that event? Or um, I don't know what observations have been made um, and maybe other people on this call can speak to it um, in terms of like seeing visuals of uh, storms or um, events that have, cause turbulence in the in the lower atmosphere. Yeah, but yeah, if it's residual something, uh, what concerns me concerns me is the rate of change of these temperatures. Basically, we move from 700 to 400 in 30 years. That's, you know, 50% ish, you know. So that's really fast is what you're saying. Extremely fast if it's something that happened you know, millions of years ago, mm -hmm. right? Because we, you know, if, if this trend continues, we're going to hit zero in you know thirty years, <laughs> and uh, I don't think that's going to happen. But yeah, cool. Okay. Well, um, <clears throat> oh, we have another question. Go ahead, Mark. 
sorry to, uh, <clears throat> well, I'll take my, my second dip here. Um, this might be a question for someone else, but first I wanted to understand the magnetic field orientation of the solar wind. Does it keep the, the, the sun's magnetic field orientation, you know, at the time that leaves the sun as it moves outward? Do, do you or anyone else know that? Well, the field orientation is locked in with the solar wind flow, right? So as that flaps about, it'll still flap about at the distant orbit of Uranus, I think. You mean at, at the 11 year cycle? Well, the magnetic Second. field changes all the time. Like, you know, in the planetary magnetic field, I'm not the best person to speak about this, mm -hmm. maybe There's someone better to talk about it than me, but it can change in really okay. short time scales. Okay, yeah. well then that answers that answers my question, yeah. So, um, okay. It happens at the Earth and it happens at Uranus. Yeah. So, okay, thank you. Um, I mean, I guess where I was going with that was just, um, ah, there's an answer in the chat about the magnetic field being dominated by the east-west component. Because this ties to that question of, does a, you know, why is one solstice different than the other? For the magnetic shielding, the umbrella that you had in your diagram to work, it would strike me that you would want the, you know, if, if the solar wind is, coupling into into things here um you would want the so the solar wind magnetic field to sort of be constant so that one solstice is different than the other but maybe it has nothing to do with the solar wind and i'm just making things up I mean, I th yeah i mean to generate this a rural current you need plasma and you can source that from the solar wind right and as the solar wind changes, the amount of plasma you have available changes too, right? I think, yeah. There was an interesting talk at AGU that talked about the solar cycle, the amount of energy available for the magnetosphere as a function of the solar cycle. Uh, back, I can't speak to the detail. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll look for that. Thank you again. Thank you. Right. Well, um, continue to think about the questions that you have. Uh, again, feel free to raise your hand, put them in the chat. Um, for now, I'm going to take screen sharing away and put up our community news slide. All right. Can you all see that? <clears throat> um, okay. So uh, we just like to, at the end uh, of these presentations, just give an update on any postdoc uh, opportunities, job opportunities, uh, workshops that are coming up just to keep uh, this community connected, especially uh, as uh, UOP, there's a lot more interest in UOP after the decadal. So I'm gonna put all of these uh, with their links in the chat um, so that you can access them. Um, and so uh, to plug our seminar series for next month, uh, we have Dr. Connor Nixon from Goddard, who's going to be talking about infrared, potential infrared observations uh, at Uranus, uh, a little bit of an instrument talk. Um, we have a couple of, uh, we have one fellowship uh, opportunity um, at Rice Space Science Space Institute, FRIES, uh, in planet formation, evolution, and habitability. Um, uh, we have some nominations up, uh, DPS prize nominations, uh, PAC membership nominations. Uh, and then I want to highlight the Uranus flagship workshop uh, that's coming up at the end of May. Uh, that's going to be hosted uh, on the East Coast at Goddard. Um, so uh, clear your schedules. Uh, I hope you're able to attend. Uh, there will be a virtual component also if you're not able to attend in person. Uh, and then uh, the next OPAG meeting, Outer Planets Assessment Group, meeting will be June 12th to the 13th. Um, again, we'll be uh, in person as well as online. Um, and you can apply for uh, travel uh, stipends as well as there's an application opportunity for an executive secretary position for a grad student uh, for that meeting. Um, so 
with that, um, I'll check the chat, see if there are any other questions, no hands raised. Um, thank you so much, uh, Henrik, for giving this presentation. Uh, I learned a lot. Um, and so everyone knows this meeting is being recorded and will be uploaded to the website. Um, so you can share with uh, your colleagues uh, if they weren't able to attend. Um, so thank you everyone. Uh, have a wonderful rest of your week and take care.